thought I should uh, stand up here and see everyone. Yeah. I usually stand there. Good morning. God is good. Can you switch this mic off right there and these so that there is no feedback? Perfect. Our church is driven by love for God and the love for people. In fact, that's the very reason why we exist. Our church exists primarily for those who have not yet said yes to Jesus. That is why we're here. Brother John just uh, passed this book to me. We think it's happiness digest, but it's uh, written in a language that most people who live in this area, not most, but a good number of them would actually read and understand. We exist for them as a church. Make use of these books. We have so many of them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we dive into your word, we ask that your word may dive into our lives. Lord, change us from the inside to the outside. May we never be the same again. In fact, may we be like Jesus. Help us now. Speak to us, rob us of all distractions, speak change into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Growing up, uh, I'm just going to move this. Growing up, you, you hear a lot of, uh, you are given a lot of advice as you grow up. In fact, I still remember a few things my uh, like my dad, my dad used to say this, and I remember, I can almost hear him say this, remember to put first things first. I guess he had seen something in my life where I would take things that should not be first and make them first. But there's, there's another piece of advice that I had growing up, and now listen, listen carefully to this. I was told that you only go around once in life. And the journey can be a very short one. So what's important in life are all the things that are eternal, not the things that are temporal. Therefore, because of that, you ought to live for Jesus Christ. Very profound advice. Kind of advice that doesn't quite circle into the mind easily. You go around once in life and the journey can be a very short one. What's important are the things that are eternal, not the things that are temporal. Therefore, you ought to live for Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I, I seem to have a problem in life where I, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes between the things that are temporal and the things that are eternal. It can be a, ch a challenge, if I can say. Because uh, if you're honest, I, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with me here. We have a tendency in life to take the things that are eternal and treat them like they are temporal. And take the things that are temporal and treat them as if they are eternal. And, and we, have, we have, I guess, reasonable... <laughs> reasons, if I can say that, why we do that, because there are some things that we found here. And so we tend to think that those things are eternal. For example, uh, you know, the political system, we think the idea of democracy is eternal. It's not. We, we think that uh, the, the idea of uh, how, how nations are structured is eternal. Because when we were born, it was like that, and therefore it should be like that. The, we think that the idea of governance, that you should have one leader and then you have others behind, we think those things are eternal. And then we start to treat them as if they are eternal. We, we, we think that, uh, for example, that people 
are temporal <laughs> because they die. And therefore, we treat them like they are temporal. And in some cases, it becomes pretty bad when we, we really treat them as if they are nothing. Because people die after all. We, we forget that one poet said it this way. He said, we forget that one day, a day that is coming soon, when even the stars are plugged out of their sockets, and whoever has the divine switch to switch off the sun, switches it off, you and I will exist eternally in heaven. I think, I think, I think sometimes we forget that People might die, but people were created to live eternally. We are created, we were created for eternity. Now th that mix up, that mix up, it's, it, it, it's, not, it's not only our problem. <laughs> ancient cultures had that problem also. Now I think, of, I think of if there's an ancient culture that had everything they ever needed, it was the Greeks. The Greek culture, in fact, one historian said it this way, he said, the Greeks, whatsoever they wanted, they invented. And whatsoever they needed, they had it. I mean, you, you talk about architecture. The Greeks had it. <laughs> Today you'll go and you view the, the Pantheon, is it? Or, and, 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 and all these beautiful, beautiful things that they built back then. The Greeks, they had it. Talk about uh, uh, philosophers. <laughs> they had them. You know, today, today they, it, it's the Greek philosophers who are just up there when you're studying philosophy. You have, you have to read their material and engage their material. You know, the Aristotles and, and all those guys, they, the Greeks had them. The Greeks had entertainment also. Think of the, the Olympics. You know, they would come and, and they would watch people racing and all that and they'll be entertained. They had that. The Greeks had that. Uh, think of medicine. The Greeks had that also. I, I, I think of um, the famous ancient physician, uh, Dr. Gallen. He was Greek. The Greeks had medicine. The Greeks had, uh, <laughs> the Greeks had scholars who would travel the ancient world and wherever they speak, they will hold audiences spellbound. You just, you just couldn't stop listening. These guys were so articulate. They were so good. The Greeks, the Greeks had them. And so when Paul planted a church in Corinth, <laughs> where Greek culture was at its best, and also at its worst, what quickly happened was that what was happening outside, the Greek culture that was happening outside filtered into the church. And when, when the world is absorbed by the church, when the standards of the world are absorbed by the church, the church has problems. And the church in Corinth had problems. I mean, in the Greek culture, it was, it was a competition of Whose line of uh, discipline is the best for the, for the growth of humanity? And the philosophers will say, hey, what, what is everyone without us? And the doctors will say, hey, we are bringing med medicine. And, and these guys will say this. And so when you come into church, you realize that the church in Corinth brought that idea into the church. And people started fighting each other. People fought each other over whose gift was better than whose gift. The musicians said, well, you know, you know we, 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 we have it made. And the guys who had the gift of prophecy said, ah, come on, what do you know? <laughs> we know stuff, we have the gift of prophecy. And those who were teachers also said, no, their gifts were important. And then there was someone else who, who had a very promiscuous relationship in church. And there was someone else, and the church had so many problems because the church absorbed the standards of the world. 
And so Paul is in Ephesus and is hearing all these things happening. And, and he starts to write a letter to the church in Corinth. He's trying to help them sort through this mess that they are in. And in that letter, he begins to address things. And, and, and he stops in chapter 13, and as, as we discussed uh, uh, for the last two weeks, and he talks about love. He says, hey, if there, is, if there is anything that can help the church, it is love. But today, uh, you know, what Paul does is that in 1 Corinthians 13, he, he, he begins to talk about love. And then he realizes, like, you know, he's... He's writing to people who need their terms defined. So he stops and then he defines his terms and he tells them that love is patient. He tells them that love is kind. He tells them that love doesn't keep a record of wrongdoings. He tells them all these things. And then he gets back to the idea that he was talking about. He, he gets back to love. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13. I want us to, to read Paul's argument on love. I, I, I guarantee you, I mean, Paul is, is about to stretch us. He's about to challenge us on our views on what is temporal and what is eternal. I'm reading follow in your Bible from verse 8, he begins by saying, love never fails. That's, a, that's an interesting Greek word there that is used for failure. The word can, can be translated and many newer translations do that. I think the NIV does that now. Check in your Bible in case I'm mistaking translations. It says that love never ends. It doesn't. Paul, Paul sets his argument up front. He says, listen, if there are things that are temporal and things that are eternal, here is something that is eternal. Love. Love is eternal. Love will never end. You will never come to a place where you say, okay, we have done away with love. Love will always be there. And then Paul begins to do something that is a bit uncomfortable with the, with the religious people. He begins to dive into religious stuff and compare it with love. <laughs> Follow in your Bible, he says, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. The word that is used there is actually not the same word as the one used for love never fails. The word that is used there means to set aside. <laughs> we, we know that is true. Prophecies will be set aside. Prophecies come to an end. There was a time when, when, when there was a prophecy that Jesus the Messiah would come and Jesus the Messiah came and that prophecy was laid aside. There was a time when, when we read in the scriptures that Unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. When that prophecy's time came, that prophecy is put aside. Because it has happened. Prophecies are not eternal. Prophecy is not eternal. Prophecy, by definition, is a marker that such, such a thing will happen at such, such a time. And when that time comes and that very event happens, that prophecy is laid aside. Because prophecies are not eternal. Prophecies are temporal. When the time comes and it happens, it is laid aside. Now we are waiting for a time. There is a prophecy that tells us that there is a time of great tribulation like no man has ever seen that is going to come. When that time comes and it passes, that prophecy will be laid aside. 
There's a prophecy that says that one day we're going to look into the skies and we're going to see a small cloud coming and we'll realize that it's actually not a cloud, it is angels. And, and Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come back to take his own back home. And the trumpet of God is going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise up and, and the way their bodies that will not be corruptible anymore. When that time comes, that prophecy is going to be laid aside and you and I are going to exist in eternity forever. That prophecy has an expiry date because prophecies have an expiry date. But Paul doesn't only stop there. So Paul is saying, listen, you, you can't compare prophecies to love because love is eternal. Prophecies come to an end. He goes on and he says, whether there are tongues, they will cease. The gift of tongues, if I remember carefully in my Bible, was given to the church at a time to notify the church that God was doing something new. God was doing something new and so they spoke in different languages. The gift of tongues is not eternal. It's not eternal. It's temporal. Every gift was given by God to show the people that God is doing something in their midst. He says, I mean, when you think about tongues, let's think about it, let's think about languages. <laughs> in the ancient world, uh, the, the, the Greeks, you know, if there was someone who was favored and respected amongst them, it was someone who knew languages. Because as it is true that the person who knows more than one language can probably think in different ways. And so, and so you know, if someone came to church in the ancient world and they were fluent in five or six languages, they were given a special position. Because somehow languages seemed to notify that you are something special. But Paul is saying, listen, even tongues, a language comes to an end. There was once a time when, when Latin was the language of, uh, of anyone who knows anything about anything. If you were important, if you were someone, you knew Latin. Today, studied by a few people, a handful of people, <laughs> I remember reading one columnist who said uh, 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 the reason why so many people do not speak Latin, it's because so many people do not speak Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds silly, but it's true. Yeah. The language came to an end. There was a time in the ancient world when if you were anyone who knew anything about anything, if you took yourself seriously, you spoke the Syrian language. The Assyrians had a, had a language that was, that was a force to be reckoned with. Where is it today? It's gone. In fact, the Assyrian language is studied by a handful of professors, of which I was reading also the other day, that people who are enrolling to go and study Assyrian is dropping. The language has come to an end. That's, that's just how it is. There was a time, even, even the very Greek that, that the Bible was written in, there was a time when it was the language of everyone. Everyone was speaking Greek. If you were someone who knew anything about anything, you spoke Greek, you communicated in Greek, you did your business in Greek. Today, a couple of theologians and other people who are interested in it go and study it in school. It's a dead language. The Hebrew that was spoken of in the Bible, the Hebrew that was spoken in during biblical times, dead language. Because tongues are not eternal. Tongues come to an end. But Paul doesn't only stop there. He says, listen, uh, 
prophecies are not eternal, uh, tongues are not eternal, tongues will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Oh, this is a painful one. Because, <laughs> you know, especially amongst Adventists. Now, if there are people who know anything about their Bibles, I guarantee you Adventists know their Bibles. But, but knowledge, knowledge is not eternal also. I'll give you an illustration here. If I said to you, um, if I said to you, listen, since you are people who love knowledge, I am going to sell, at the end of the Sabbath, I am going to sell, <laughs> sell a, 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 a set that I have of uh, uh, encyclopedias. Okay? 12 volume set and I'm going to sell it to whoever wants it and I'm sure if you love knowledge and you know you love knowing something about nothing and all that stuff you think uh, going to jeopardy is a, a goal in life <laughs> uh, you'll probably be interested in the set until I tell you that it is a set from 1952 then at that point you will take a step back. Say, ah, no. Because you know very well that everything in that encyclopedia has either been challenged or changed. Because knowledge is not consistent. There was once a time, there was once a time when the people in the medical world said, listen, if you want to heal someone, if someone is very sick, you have to cut them and bleed them. That's how people get better. Today, that's a no-no. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you teach people this, they, they, will, they will report you. You'll, you, you'll lose your license. You, you can't teach that. That knowledge has been challenged. There was once a time in the, in the ancient world, not too far away in the times, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, 1800s, 1900s, well, 1800s, where they believed that in order to maintain your health, you need to make sure that you bath at least once a month. <laughs> or a year. That's how, they, they, that's how they did it. Today, that knowledge has been challenged. There is absolutely, absolutely nothing out there that has not been revisited or challenged. Because knowledge... Knowledge is not eternal. We continue to grow and we know more and more stuff. And the more stuff we know, the more we challenge that stuff. And we know <laughs> there was once a time when you would go to school. And if you wanted to take anthropology, for example, uh, that was it. Everything was just thrown in there. Today they ask you, which part of it do you want? All, all, there was once a time you'd go to school and you'd study medicine and that's it. Today they ask you, but what's your specialization? There's so much knowledge out there and we keep challenging that knowledge because knowledge is not eternal. It's not eternal. What we know today will be challenged tomorrow. And it will go away as if we knew nothing at all. Paul carries on here. He says in verse 9, we know in part and we prophesy in part. It's, it's never full. It's never. If you find yourself getting to a place where you can say, you know what, I know everything that is out there that needs to be known. You are fooling yourself. It's all in part. If you ever get to a time when you say, you know what, I have studied the prophecies, I know everything that needs to be known in prophecy, you are fooling yourself. You know it in part. By the way, did you know that 99.99% of all the prophecies in the Bible, we only knew what they meant when they had happened. I mean, we, we were wrong about the greatest prophecy of all, the end of the 2,300 days. We were wrong about it and, and the Millerite movement and, and all of those guys thought, you know what, Jesus is coming again. And there was a great movement and we were wrong. It's 
own in part. But when that which is perfect, verse 10, has come, then that which is in part will be done away. On that day when Jesus comes again, on that day when he calls us and we meet him in the sky, on that day when you and I start to, when we start to live eternally, it is at that point when we will start to know things and truly know them. It's a topic for another day. But, but Paul, in, in the tradition of all uh, speakers, you, you don't say a lot of heavy stuff without an illustration. He, he gives an illustration in verse 11 of what he's talking about. He says, listen, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, don't let that just pass by. Paul is saying, first of all, he's saying, listen, it doesn't matter what it is in life. It doesn't matter what it is. Now he's talking about religious stuff here. He says, it's not eternal. In fact, let me, let me read something for you. Almost forgot to read this for you. Uh, one of my favorite authors said this just to, to show us how temporal things are. I'm going to read. It's a bit of a read here. See if uh, the technology will cooperate. This is uh, uh, Malcolm Magridge. He was British. Listen to what he says. This is quite interesting. We look back upon history and what do we see? He's asking. What do we see when we look back at history? Empires rising and falling, revolutions and counter-revolutions, wealth accumulating and wealth dispersed, one nation dominant and then another. Shakespeare speaks of the rise and the fall of great ones, the herb and flow with the moon. I look back at my own fellow countrymen, he's talking about the British. I look back at my own fellow countrymen ruling over a quarter of the world, the great majority of them convinced in the words of what is still a favorite song, that God who's made the mighty would make them mightier yet. I've heard a crazed, cracked Austrian announce to the world the establishment of a German Reich that would last a thousand years. An Italian clown announced that he would restart the calendar to begin with his own ascension to power. I've heard a murderous Georgian brigand in the Kremlin acclaimed by the intellectual elite of the world as wiser than Solomon, more humane than Marcus Aurelius, more enlightened than Ashoka. I've seen America wealthier in terms of weaponry, more powerful than the rest of the world put together. So that had the American people desired, they could have outdone an Alexander or a Julius Caesar in the range and scale of their conquest. Are you following this? Now listen to what he says. All in one lifetime, he saw it, all in his lifetime, all in one lifetime, all of it gone with the wind. All of it, it's gone. It seemed like it will last forever. It's gone. It doesn't stop there. England, a part of a tiny island off the coast of Europe, threatened with dismemberment. It's happening. And even bankruptcy. Hitler and Mussolini dead, remembered only in infamy. Stalin, a forbidden name in the regime he helped found and dominant for, dominate, dominate for some three decades. America haunted by fears of running out of those precious fluids that keep her motorways roaring and the smog settling with troubled memories of a disastrous campaign in Vietnam and the victories over the Don Quai Otis of the media as they charged the windmills of Watergate. All in one lifetime, he says. All of it in one lifetime and all of it gone with the wind. It's, it's not eternal. It's gone. And so he gives an illustration. Paul gives an illustration. He says, listen, when it comes to things that are temporal and, and things that are eternal, it's, it's, like a, it's like an example from childhood. When you are a child, 
you do childish things. But when you grow up, you stop doing childish things. The growing up that Paul is talking about here is when the church in Corinth, the church today, when you and I stop focusing on the things that are temporal and focus on what's eternal. And in this context, it's love. When, when the most important thing in your spiritual existence is still prophecies, tongues, and all these other things, Paul says you are still, you are still dwelling in childishness. You have to get to a place where you grow up. It's not that those things are not important, but you have to get to a place where you grow up and you start dealing with adult things. Love. And you start loving. I mean, if you go for a party, okay, the Andrews family is going to have a celebration sometime this week, probably tomorrow. Somewhere in that celebration, if... Uh, if Pastor Len says to everyone, listen, I have a speech um, because you all love Pastor Len and you listen to him. And, and then he says, uh, I have kept up with my baby talk. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> and then he starts speaking like a baby. See, I, I have kept up with my bubbly, bubbly baby talk. You all, you are all going to listen, but someone is going to call an ambulance quickly. Because you know there is something wrong. You know, if I stand up here and say, church, you know, I have, a, I have this gift of, of keeping up with my baby talk. I'm, I'm going to preach like a baby today. And then I start, you know, waffling and mumbling and bubbling. You're all going to call an ambulance. Because you know there is something wrong. When you grow up, you leave childish things. You leave it behind. And yet somehow, in religion today, we choose to embrace the things that are not eternal. Okay, not that they are not important. They are just not eternal. Love is eternal. Paul actually makes another illustration there. Let me just go through it quickly. He says, it's, it's like the mirrors back then. You know, in, in ancient Corinth, they had these bronze. Uh, they, they didn't have, you know... Mirrors like we have them today, they would, you, know, you know, you polish brass until it's so shiny and then you can almost see yourself. He says, you know, those who are still childish, it's, it's like you're, you're, you're looking at, uh, at, at those brass mirrors and, and, and there's uh, someone coming behind you and you're trying to see it, but you can't see, it's, it's dim. You really can't see clearly. Paul says, yeah, it's like, it's like that. Until you embrace love, it's like you, when you embrace love, then it's like turning around and, and you see face to face. And that's how it is. He, it's like growing up, it's like looking at a mirror. And then he says this in, at the end. To make sure that his point is is heard. He says, and now, verse 13, abide these three, faith, hope, and love. The word used, therefore, abide is, is, is the word remain. Now, these three are eternal, Paul is saying, listen, these three are eternal, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these three is love. If there is something of these three that you, can, that you can hold on to, something that you can bank on, it is love. Faith, the practice of faith without love, the practice of hope without love can prove to be very dangerous and even toxic. The greatest of these is love. Now, Paul didn't explain why, why he's saying that, you know, but, but when you look into it, when you look at Paul, for example, look at Paul's example. You know, Paul went for his, uh, when they were going for his first missionary journey, he took Barnabas and a young man called John Mark. And, and the young men behaved like many young men. As soon as things got tough, he said, okay, brothers, um, you know, as you go, I'm going to go back home and uh, pray for you. 
while you guys carry on. And he went back home and Paul didn't like it at all. In fact, when they were going for the second missionary journey, Paul, Paul and Barnabas, after a spiritual high in the Jerusalem council, they hit an old time law when Paul said, I am not taking this young man with me. And yet Barnabas, who understood the truth of what we're talking about, said, no, we have to. In fact, I'll go with him. And so Paul, on his secondary, second missionary journey, as he's doing his rounds, he passes through Corinth, and you know very well in his heart that God has spoken to him, convicted him, and convinced him of the wrong that he did of how he valued mission above love, of how he valued everything above loving this young man. And so he writes. In 1 Corinthians, he actually writes, he doesn't even criticize Barnabas. He says, I think in chapter 9, where he says, listen, uh, we have sacrificed everything. Barnabas and I have sacrificed everything. He doesn't speak negatively about him. In 1 Timothy, he tells us that John Mark is so important to him in ministry. He realized that it's love that's eternal. It's love. When you practice your faith without love, you get to a place where, where you know the beasts and everything of revelation far much more than you know Jesus, the Messiah. Say, how many horns did that beast have? And you just pull it off. Someone could wake you up at night and say, what does the beast look like? And you will describe it. Love. Love Jesus. Love people. Our church exists primarily for those who have not yet said yes. That's why we're here. Here's the thing. When we do that, when we treat love, when we focus on loving, listen carefully. You and I practice godlikeness. For God is love. When we love the unlovable, those who seem to be totally against us and we choose to love them, we are experiencing Christ-likeness. Because he loved you and me even at the point where we shouted, crucify him. He loved us. When we love people, when we love the unlovables and, and the, the so-called untouchables, we become like God who in his glory and power and everything that he was, he could have recreated this world when we sinned. But in fact, as Paul said it, he sent Jesus to reconcile the world to himself because he loved us. I'm not saying love is going to be, you know, because it's easy to love those who are lovable. <laughs> I'm not saying this is going to be simple. Uh, what I am saying is that as we love as we focus on that which is eternal, as we invest on things that are eternal, as we love, our characters will be changed. Because love is going to challenge us. We will have to love, love when, they, when we have no reason to love at all. And still love because God is love. We would have to love when people have offended us and yet we will still have to love because God is love. And Paul was saying to the church in Corinth, listen, instead of taking sides, fighting each other, wondering who's greater than who, how about you stop and love each other? Because he said it, he said, listen, if you love each other, you're not going to have those meetings where you say, should we eat food offered to idols? You're not going to have that meeting. Because I love you, I'm not going to eat that food because it, 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 it hurts you. And because you love me, you're not going to condemn me. You know, and, and a church that operates on this principle of love is a church that grows. Paul says, listen, we can talk theology as much as we want, but when it is void of love, it's empty. Now, one day, I had a friend, I was born in... Uh, in Zimbabwe, I had a friend who was flying from South Africa uh, to North America, and 
I would, uh, do you know, there's this nice thing, this, you go online, you punch in the, the flight number and everything, and you can track the flight. And so I, you know, I do that, I, I tracked my friend's flight, and I'll be honest, he, this, is, this has been recorded, he'll probably watch this. Uh, I fell asleep, I mean, it didn't bother me. I would wake up and then just check, ah, oh, he's still fine. Oh, he landed. Okay, that's fine. You know, it was a totally different issue when it was my wife and daughters who were on that same flight coming to North America. Before they caught that flight, I was online already, waiting to see if it would be on time. Because I had a, a huge investment in that flight. The ones whom I love were in there. When that flight took off, I watched that thing. I hardly went to bed that night. Just watching. Okay? And if it looks like it didn't move for a couple of minutes, I'll get worried. <laughs> but it was moving. Because I, I love the people who were in there. And as soon as it lands, I'm saying, okay, she needs to connect to her Wi-Fi or something and tell me that they are fine, you know. And I'm sending message after message after message, you know, wondering if they are okay. They are fine. They are fine. You know, but, but I kept watch because there was an object of love there. When we do that in church, you'll realize that the things we focus on start to change because we love. It's no longer about whether you dressed right or you eat right or you, but you are a child of God. Amen. And I love you. Amen. 